Hello, welcome to Legal Action. My name is David Siegel. Thanks for joining us. Today, along with my co-host, Jesse Berrientes, we have Ross Rosenberg, psychotherapist. Ross, welcome to the show. Thank you. The topic today is surviving your divorce. And we're going to get into some of the, the topics that come up between families, between parties, prior to a divorce, through a divorce, and eventually after the divorce is finalized. So, Ross, welcome to the show. Please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, I'm Ross Rosenberg. I'm a psychotherapist. I also am an addiction specialist, a certified addiction specialist. I, I work with families. I work with uh, teenagers. I work with adults in a variety of problems. Um, and I also own a counseling agency, Clinical Care Consultants, in Arlington Heights. Okay. We're going to talk about counseling as it comes into effect before an official divorce is filed. So we want to kind of take it from the standpoint of a couple having a problem and before they even talk to a lawyer, before they even think about divorce and the, the dreaded D word, they might make an appointment with someone like you for help, correct? That is right. How does that start? How does that work? Well, often um, when you are married and you are having problems, you have conflict and there's arguments. Sometimes the uh, conflict is a, a lack of communication. Um, so there's two types of um, uh, problems that you have. It's something that is um, overt in that um, um, arguments um, and sometimes it's covert where you're mad at each other and you don't talk and there's a breakdown in communication. So one or both of the parties uh, decide that it's time to get some help. They want to um, solve the problem and they're looking, they're looking for a professional to help them so they don't have to get a divorce. Now, do you think, think that, or you see that people come in willingly or uh, unwillingly, or one spouse doesn't want to come in and that person really is just going in to pacify or try to pacify the other spouse? Typically, it's one, one, of, the spouse, uh, one of the spouses prefers therapy over the other. Usually there is a spouse that is um, more upset than the other and gives an ultimatum. Um, and with that ultimatum, the other spouse will come with them because they are either ambivalent and they're not sure if they want to be married or they are out of the marriage and they're just doing this to um, um, appease their spouse. And if I'm lucky, I get, I get two spouses who actually really want to work on the marriage and then give me an opportunity to uh, potentially change and save the, the relationship. Uh, I'm curious, and I think it's important to just, you know, we always talk about statistics. Is there, have you seen more uh, men or women that are more, you know, the, the resistant ones to, to come in? I would, I would just guess, as a guess, I would think men just because, you know, we think we can fix everything by ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, typically the men are more resistant. Women in our society um, have more of a background of communication, more of comfort and ease in expressing feelings. Men, on the other hand, tend to, um, uh, th tend to be raised within our culture to uh, show their feelings through actions, not through words, not through communication. And so women um, feel more comfortable in counseling than do men. What types of problems or reasons are more amenable to therapy? Well, the, the problems that are more, most amenable to therapy are the problems that can be solved. For example, if there is infidelity and one of the sp uh, spouses are actively um, with someone else um, having an affair um, and they have been caught, for example, um, you know, or let's say they're a sex addict, um, if the one spouse has no intention of stopping the relationship or um, is um, has a pattern of multiple affairs. Those are those are the those are the the, the, the cases where you don't really see much progress in therapy. It's yeah. almost as if you can see that it's over before it began. Are there any other red flags that you see people coming in that really uh, don't uh, you know not in kind of an honest uh, attempt to really try to take the full benefit of the counseling and the therapy? Oh yeah. Um, one of the red flags is someone is lying. And the lies or the deception or the deceit is pretty easy to pick up because one spouse will have evidence, uh, will have what they think is proof that the other spouse has lied or cheated or has done something that um, they have kept secret. And in the face of that evidence, um, the spouse will deny it. And that's a big red flag that something's going on because normally when you have two spouses who are having marital problems, they want help, 
the person who, let's say, has or had done something wrong um, will admit it, and they will take ownership or responsibility. But the spouse that comes into therapy and denies it, and, and then it's a he said or she said. Yeah, I, th I think back in the day it was easier <coughs> to get away with this adulterous situation because there wasn't the Internet, the social media, the text messages. I mean, a lot of these couples, and I talk to them, a lot of them, you know, through divorce cases, they've got the other spouse dead to rights. There's, no, there's nothing they could say. They've got the text message. They've broken into their email. How do you address that kind of situation? Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's worse than you think. There are um, computer programs, software programs, that can um, monitor everything you do, either on a cell phone or a computer. And when I see someone, sometimes they've, they actually have transcripts of uh, people's uh, um, all communications, emails, um, Facebook accounts. Um, and when you are faced as a therapist with that evidence, the goal is to disarm the person who is guilty, disarm the person who has uh, lied, and try to invite both into a reconciliation process. The last thing you want to do as a therapist is to take a side. So in that first session when the angry spouse is um, trying to justify why he or she needs to change, the goal of a, um, a therapist is to set up the relationship where you're a neutral party, the fine areas in which they both can uh, um, agree to start working on. When you look at the social media, and that is a very, uh, I mean, we never had that stuff before, and just like you, I see that all of the time too, why you would put that on your Facebook and Twitter, I'm not exactly completely sure what that is, but I have, you know, uh, a good thought about that. Uh, and, you know, you also have issues in terms of text because a lot of times things aren't complete strings. They're, uh, it's one side of the conversation like you would too on, uh, on the other social media and all that stuff. Is that something that as a therapist that you would, you would review while they're in session with you, review ahead of time, or I mean, is it that, that both both people can just give you things separately so that you're uh, ready for the, how does that exactly work? Well, if you're a therapist, you have to remember that you have to find a neutral ground. You want to invite both of the parties into a process of reconciliation, healing, forgiveness, or even accountability. And the last thing you want to do is to be a judge, to uh, make a decision, um, to um, decide who's right or wrong. So uh, typically we avoid collecting that material. We actually refuse to review that because it puts us in a position where we might um, take a side. So for example, if um, a woman says, well, look at all of these emails he sent to, this, uh, to, to his girlfriend. As soon as I pick up those emails and read them, I present myself as on her side. So typically what I do is I say, it's not important for me to read that or to see the information, but to know how you're feeling and what you want to do with it, is find, a, um, find, um, an, a, find an approach to draw them both in. Because marital therapy is about the relationship. It's not about the individuals. You want to get them to see you are here to maybe save the marriage, not to see who's right or who's wrong. Yeah. Now you talked about bringing them both in. What do you do in a case where you see that one party already has a foot out the door and is not interested in engaging in this counseling at all? Well, well, Dave, I have to first tell you that I have a very direct style. And if I think that someone's coming into my office for marital therapy and they are a willing participant and I find out that they're lying, um, they're um, lying to me or lying to uh, their wife, um, my first attempt is to get them to tell the truth and to let them know or reframe this whole process is not for me to decide who's right or wrong, but to find a way to save the marriage. And if they continue to lie or continue to deceive me, um, usually on the second session I call them out, is I find a way to let them know that this is not a place for um, you to continue the deception because you're paying good money and you're utilizing professional services, why would you want to continue the lies or the deception? Yeah. If he really has a foot out the door, he might not show up to that second Sorry. session. She uh, might show up alone. Well, and, and that does happen. That's why you have to be very, very careful. Um, the last thing you should do is you should be afraid of saying something to lose a client. You should always be aware of the power of your words. So if someone is lying, someone is withholding information, the best thing you can do sometimes is, is to confront that person 
and when I say confront, in a safe, in a safer way, um, and not in a, um, a threatening way, um, in an encouraging way, and to let them know that this is not a place where you can continue the deception. This is a place where you can find a way to be open to solve the problem. You certainly can <clears throat> if there's an issue with one of the one of the parties that they come to you for counseling, and if one person just heads for the door and doesn't come back for that second session, uh, still certainly can uh, aid the other spouse in dealing with or handling that particular situation that they're going through. Well, see, th that's an interesting question because there there's therapeutic boundaries that you have to take into consideration. If you start off as a marriage therapist. You do not want to then go into, um, into the role as an individual therapist w with one of the clients because if there is a session where everything goes bad and one of the spouses walks out or doesn't return for the next session and then you agree to meet with the other spouse who's left there, um, what happens then if the spouse that walks out comes back, you've um, tilted the relationship into an unfair balance and the spouse who's returning will feel that you are on their side. So whenever possible, you want to stay with the client, and the client is the relationship. And if they need individual therapy, you refer them out. To somebody else. It, it's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a divorce mediator as well, and certainly that's different. As, as a mediator, they're already in the court system. There's right. already been a breakdown of the marriage, and you're just trying to help them make a decision. Uh, for the the best interest of of the kids and and mm -hmm. so it's kind of similar in that you're not taking sides you're in control of the process they're in control of the outcome but you, you always get different things in those sessions what we you know typically kind of do is just you know is let somebody say something give the other person a chance to respond just to you know sometimes people just feel in that setting they just right. want to get it off of their chest and you know uh, I can certainly uh, imagine that in a counseling session there are some deep uh, kind of hurtful things that people may say that cut down deep to the marrow. Oh, absolutely. And, and mediation um, is far different um, in therapy uh, than therapy, although they share similarities. In fact, I was trained years ago as a mediator. Medi in mediation, you're trying to get people to agree on difficult subjects uh, for which there's a lot of uh, disagreement. In therapy, you're trying to get to why they're disagreeing. You're trying to get them to solve the relation pro relationship problem that uh, that um, results in the disagreement. Mm -hmm. And when people are really angry at each other, you start off with uh, you start off with not going deep or not going into the actual reason for the relationship problem. But eventually, in therapy, you have to get there. It's not about um, coming to an agreement. It's about finding out what about the relationship has gone wrong, because they're coming to my office to solve a problem. The assumption is, if someone uh, schedules a marital session with me. They want to save the marriage. They want to solve the problem of the marriage. And I always take that assumption until they say they want to get a divorce or it's not going to work, and then I shift. Let's talk about the different problems that you see. If you can kind of give us a hierarchy of what you see in terms of a percentage based on problems in a marriage. Can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, the most common problem is infidelity. And now with the Internet... Real or perceived? Real or perceived? Um, more often than not, it's real. It's real. Okay. Um, in the cases of uh, if one of the partners has a mental illness, then you have the problems with perception. But if, um, if, a, uh, if a spouse believes that they've been cheated upon or um, they believe that their partner um, has um, a lover or, um, or is seeing someone on the side, more often than not, it's, it's true. It's where there's smoke, there's fire in many cases. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's, it almost always proves to be true because over time, um, in most cases, the person that finally um, is going, is, gets caught and um, the spouse that goes, seeks an attorney, it's about um, the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth time and they've reached that point where they just can't deal with it anymore. Is there, a, is there a point at which reconciling is more harmful than just breaking apart and doing the dissolution of marriage? Um, in, the case, in the case of child abuse, uh, in the case of uh, sexual abuse, in the case of um, 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 violence, um, in the case of um, um, a chronic history of, uh, of um, harmful behavior, reconciliation can be um, dangerous. But 
as a therapist, uh, <coughs> we have an ethical position to try to solve and save the marriage. We work with what people bring to our office. If someone hires us or me to help them with their marriage, we have to find a way first to see if it's possible. Actually, I have a, yeah. a couple of follow-up questions sure. because it's, it's, it's intriguing to me. You know, when, when you, you look at that type of thing, and I, again, I'm thinking about my train as well, are you a mandatory reporter? Because, you know, if you talk about things like, you know, a lot of families have a secret. Oh, there's a family secret. And, you know, something may come out in these sessions that have never been, or one spouse might suspect it or because uh, a lot of times we just get people who say things because they're just jockeying for positions a lot of times just to get custody and, and those things a lot of times it may be true it may be perceived uh, but you know sometimes you know there's just really no kind of sure kind of way but certainly in therapy in a different setting if that comes to the you know the forefront where there is that kind of harm going on what is the uh, well let's let's start off with the question am I a mandatory reporter um, every therapist is a mandatory reporter, which means um, we, have, uh, we have to report if there is harm um, to um, children, um, um, if there has been any form of uh, physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. We must, uh, we must uh, report that to DCFS. We should not ever make a personal opinion whether it's right or wrong. But there are very clear rules and laws of confidentiality um, that cover the psychotherapy process. And we have to explain to the client on the very first session, often in the first five minutes of, when, on our meeting, of what exactly those rules are and how they work. And one is we disclose that we are a man mandated reporter, and we also talk about the limits of confidentiality. So that they're aware of that. What is, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were going in a different direction with the uh, reporting. I Which, thought you were going to talk about a, a criminal act where one party wants to do harm to the other because or to the other's paramour or lover or whatnot that's where I thought you were going with well, that. Well which also may come up too I mean and which is the, the kind of follow-up question to that is also the domestic violence you know right. we're trained in terms of looking at domestic right. violence and everything else right and so uh, sometimes you know let's say that a couple comes in and there is a history of domestic violence or maybe even an order of protection which would have to be modified, in, in my opinion, to be able to, to enter the thing. That happens sometimes. Oh, yeah, you know, we're okay for this purpose. And the, the courts love counseling. But again, I, I'm already anticipating that situation, but you don't necessarily have to have a divorce pending if there is a, an order of protection. So right. uh, in, in kind of those things, what is it that it's the same situation in terms of? Well, I mean, it's very clear cut to a therapist that if there's any dangerous or potentially dangerous uh, behavior, or reports, you have, to, you have to report them without any hesitation. However, if you are in a session with a client and they tell you about a personal accounting of something that happened to them um, and they're not in present danger and their children aren't in present danger, you have, uh, you have to keep confidentiality and, it, and the laws are very clear on that. So it's only the uh, immediate danger there? It's about risk of... Uh, the, the term we use is risk of harm to self and others. If someone is at risk of harming themselves, um, suicide, uh, self-mutilation, or harming others through um, an aggressive, violent sexual act, you must tell someone. Yeah. You, um, therefore, if I'm in a session and someone discloses to me that they plan to go home and beat up their wife or their kids, um, if I can't talk them out of it and feel confident that they won't do it, I must call the police. And I set that up in the very first session. They, um, every client knows the possibility of me disclosing information if I think they're at risk of harming self or others. Very grown. Yeah. Yeah. How do you deal with an angry, hostile person or couple that seem to be leaning more towards ending the relationship as opposed to working on the relationship to save it? How do you deal? What's your approach with that? Well, my approach with the angry, hostile couple is to, is to try to calm them down is to set very clear boundaries of behavior in a session. Because up to that point, they have been yelling, um, screaming sometimes, and sometimes just plain old not talking. So I become a referee of sorts. I say these are the rules of our therapy session, and I would, I would love to help you, but we must participate in a way that fits the rules of therapy. 
And if they continue to do that, just like we do with children, we set limits and boundaries. And we give one chance, two chance. And then if they don't, I, I end the session. Um, you time them out. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. No, but, but, it's a, but it is a form of, of time out. But if you do that just once, um, that's a message the clients get that they can't behave in, their, in, in the therapy offices they do at home. And it's usually just enough where they stop. Or when I say, if you yell one more time, the session's over, um, and they yell one more time, the session's over, and what I say is, now, if you want, and I want you to think about this, um, I'm willing to see you again, but you have to, um, you have to abide by the therapy rules. And uh, that is the end of the session. And just like children, if there's consistency, and there's follow through, and there's fairness, uh, they'll come back to session and they'll start to behave. And if they don't, there's no need to have therapy if people are yelling or screaming. Uh, are there any relationship or personality attributes that uh, are more prone to you know, reconciliation than, than not? I know that's just a really broad, oh. open question, but uh, it, you know, obviously if you have somebody you can't lead a horse to water sure. if somebody's just dead set again. I mean, you, know, you need you need both people. But are, are there any particular traits that are are just you know more lean toward that kind of direction? History, uh, history um, in the marriage. When you have a marriage of thirty years, and they say the first twenty years were great, but the last ten years, he started drinking. He started um, looking at uh, porn on the internet. When someone has that history, that is a, a sign, or what I call a green flag, of positive outcomes. Um, when um, they can communicate, even despite their problems or their differences, but they know how to communicate their feelings or they know how to listen, they still might have irreconcilable differences, but they, st but they, yet, you, they yet have the skills to communicate their problems. A good therapist will then work with them to get them to communicate what they're unhappy about, what they don't like, and then draw them together into a process of reconciliation. So to your question is, is the ability to communicate um, and, and having a, um, a history uh, of a positive, positive experiences in a relationship. What, what's the time frame of your sessions in terms of hours or minutes and the duration and frequency? Typically, sessions are between 45 and 50 minutes. Um, Tension span. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, there's, you could go longer, and some therapists will go an hour, hour and 15 minutes. But normally, 45 to 50 minutes is just the right time to talk about the problems, to get the attention of both, uh, of both uh, spouses. Um, and often, in the beginning of, uh, of marital problems, in, in, in the, excuse me, in the beginning of marital therapy, uh, once a week is preferred. If, it's in cri if the couple are in crisis, twice a week. But you really don't want to go beyond twice a week. Well, I mean, because I, I, I'm, I'm curious here too, because a lot of folks that have come to me for a lot of different reasons, but you know, for example, there are some Christian people that are, are seeking a Christian counseling or a, sure. a Christian attorney, which is a whole other show, I guess. But uh, obviously, the, the difference is maybe the starting points in terms of, hey, listen, as a Christian, you know, you know, you can divorce only for marital unfaithfulness, but you know, you're supposed to try to be uh, forgiving and you're supposed to try to get past it because, uh, you know, of those religious principles. So are, do you see any of those kind of interactions? Typically when people are seeking a Christian therapist, they, um, they ask at the intake uh, process, um, if you do um, or if you ascribe to the principles of Christian mm -hmm. psychotherapy. And uh, we don't. We, we, like many counselors or counseling agencies, are generic in our religious approach. Mm -hmm. um, many therapists, including myself, will bring spirituality and religion into the session if the clients bring it into the session. But we do not use religion or the Bible to base our therapy approach. There are very uh, fine and qualified therapists who use um, that approach to solving problems. So it's a different, it's a different, uh, well, not really, the, the focus is always on the relationship, but the difference is just some of the principles 
that they would m utilize a little bit more than something else? I wish I could talk, talk more about that, but I'm not trained in uh, Christian psychotherapy um, because I do not use biblical, um, um, uh, the Bible or the tenets of religion right. as the foundation of therapy. Um, I could only speak to it from more of a, a generic perspective. Sure. How do you measure the level of success that you can have with a couple when you may not know them in a duration? You might only have a, a series of sessions and then you don't really know what happens. How do you, how do you gauge your, your level of success? Well, first is they, if they come back to a second session. <laughs> um, and, and, and often that says a lot. Um, second is... Um, there's a, there's a sincerity in people that really want to save the marriage. There's a, there's a desperation. There's a sadness. And, and when you get that from both, you have something to work with. And when they come back for the second session and they're both trying, and you can see that they're trying, even if they're making mistakes or relapsing in old behavior, um, those are the signs that something is going well. And again, again therapy... Uh, marital therapy, the, the client is the relationship. And so you're working on the relationship. And, if, and you, of course, want to try for reconciliation. You want to save the marriage. But sometimes the relationship is best suited to move in its own direction. If they are not meant to uh, be married or they, their differences are irreconcilable, the best thing you can do is move them in a direction that, is, that um, um, preserves their dignity, um, um, keeps the children safe, and, and helps them move on. Are you comfortable recommend, recommending a separation period in certain cases? Or do you feel that's one step towards the inevitable divorce? I don't like to recommend separation or divorce. I like to bring people to that, to that decision. Um, often that has, already, that has already been decided and they are either wanting to be separated or they are separated. Um, the only times that I would recommend a separation is if someone's at risk of harm. Um, if um, the woman is an alcoholic and is um, dangerous uh, around the children or potentially volatile. Yeah. Um, that is when, um, for the sake of safety, you would recommend uh, a separation. But you really don't want to recommend a separation because the rule of thumb is once you're outside of the house, it's that much more difficult to save the marriage. There's a dynamic that, that occurs that, uh, that, um, that with separation, it becomes more difficult to bring the marriage together. Because there's, there's, there's that distance and, and so less familiarity. Yeah, it's like one, it's one, it's one foot Put off. Um, that, that's out. And obviously you take pride in helping people. That's why you've chosen this trade. And it must feel good to bring a couple together, especially after infidelity or abuse or addiction, correct? I have the best job in the world. Sometimes I can't believe I get paid for what I do because when I see a person or a couple um, get what they need uh, and I can save a relationship or help them rekindle the love that they lost. Okay. Thank you, Ross Rosenberg, Jesse Variantes. My name is David Siegel. You've been watching Legal Action. You can check out LegalActionTV.com or send us questions at questions at LegalActionTV.com. We'll see you next time on Legal Action. Thank you.